Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Micheletto. I, uh, I work in the Condensed Matter Group in the School of Physics and I've uh, just received an ERC starting grant and so I'm setting up my own group to, to start some uh, um, nice research in, on uh, DNA biophysics. Um, I'm Freya Bull, I'm a third year physics PhD student and I study how bacterial infections develop on urinary catheters. First question, what inspired you to become a scientist? I think I always knew that uh, I wanted to become a scientist. Now, whether which kind of scientist, I, I didn't really know uh, until I started doing physics. But um, already from the start, I was, I was attracted by, I guess, the, uh, the beauty of, of nature. And so I was, uh, I was kind of very curious in, uh, towards uh, biology. So uh, exploring a little bit of biology and, uh, and, and physics in particular. Yeah, I guess I guess I wasn't very very determined to do physics until uh, until uh, I had to choose after high school uh, what I wanted to do, and then so I actually applied also for uh, for medicine and molecular biology. But then what I didn't like about those uh, areas is that the the knowledge, at least in, in my view, was a little bit cataloged, as in uh, you had to remember many names or definitions, acronyms, these kind of things, rather than understanding things from first principles. Now I see things a little bit differently, but, uh, but yeah, that was my view at that point. So your research is on like the topology of DNA. How did you end up doing that? Since that's quite a niche area of physics. I was thinking about it this morning and um, when I was doing my, my bachelor in, in Italy, I did a little course on polymers, but I thought they were very lame. So <laughs> I thought, hmm, that, that is not for me. But then um, again, as you know, many things, uh, the, more, the more you study something and the more you appreciate uh, what's, going, what's going on behind the, the, the first impressions, let's say. I ended up doing, doing my PhD uh, uh, first. So I was in a complexity science DTC in Warwick. So my first year was uh, um, on, on, again, a master project on, on uh, I, I, I picked the neuroscience. So I, I did a little bit of neuroscience as well. And um, then as a PhD, uh, the, basically it was on my only choice in that department to do something that was physically relevant to physics and to statistical mechanics was, uh, uh, was uh, with Professor Matthew Turner at, at that point where, um, and he proposed, uh, proposed me to, to, to study ring polymers and, yeah, I, I didn't, you know, ended up being uh, uh, fed up by, by polymers at the end of my PhD, but actually I saw that they were more and more interesting and relevant also for biological um, systems. And so actually towards the end of my PhD, I left behind a little bit the synthetic polymer um, field and I went more and more into a more biological kind of scenario settings. Um, and then, and then now more recently, actually, I, I, I made a step back from, uh, from the biology back to material science. So now what I'm, the, the DNA topology is, um, is, 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 uh, is interesting for me for, from a material science perspective rather than a biological perspective, but I had to go kind of, had to see this, uh, um, had, I had to see this from, from many angles before realizing, um, before realizing this. Actually, I think that leads on to one of my other questions. Can you tell me about Annaloni? Actually, this is a funny story. It's a funny anecdote to this one as well. So um, I was at the conference in Les Uches in France and, um, and, and typically in Les Uches, so uh, there are many Russian physicists that are invited typically. So it, so I was presenting my poster on, uh, on uh, ring polymers and, um, and this uh, uh, quite old Russian uh, professor uh, is called uh, is, uh, Ale uh, Alexander uh, Grosberg uh, came to me and said, um, I, 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 cannot, I cannot fake a Russian accent. But basically, basically he came to me and said, oh, uh, this is uh, very interesting. Well, oh, hold on, you're Italian. Uh, yes, uh, what about this? Oh. Why, why don't you make pasta that is ring shaped? And I said, yeah, why not? And then he went on explaining that there was a PRL paper or something about uh, uh, people who were 
knotting knots on pieces of spaghetti and depending on which oil you will put, then these knots will be able to slide or, or being, I don't know, pulled more strongly. I don't, know. I don't remember the details. But um, uh, basically the, <laughs> uh, the point is that it was him who suggested to, <laughs> to, to try to do this. And so I went home and, and, said, and said to my wife, oh, you know, this Russian physicist just, uh, you know, suggested us to, well, me to, to, to do this. Should we actually try it? And then we did, and uh, and and it was a fun couple of days, I think, to figure out. Uh, because, yeah, it was it was fun, and it was kind of fun. Then we it ended up in a physics world uh, article as well, so that was that was also quite cool. Is there an area in your field at the moment that you find particularly exciting? It could be your research or someone else's research. Yeah, I think um, I'm I'm a little bit undecided on this one, but uh, I think there is definitely potential about uh, for. Uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence in soft matters. This is one thing. Another thing that I'm particularly excited about, and, and this is more relevant to, to my research, is that uh, I think there is, a lot, is, there is a lot that can be learned from nature in general. So how nature makes things in general. And, and I mean, I'm not the first one. Obviously, there is a whole field of biomaterials and synthetic biology and so on. But perhaps what, uh, what hasn't been appreciated so far is that um, I mean, there are a lot of people that look at how cells make things or how tissues, I mean, how tissues self-assemble or uh, cells behave, but very few people, as far as I know, looked at what happens inside the nucleus of cells, where the DNA is being uh, stored and is being handled, manipulated, and this is what we are trying to do, basically, trying to learn how these machines handle DNA so that we can make materials using DNA that can be topologically reconfigurable, for instance, or, or uh, these kind of things. If you want to study the topology of DNA, where do you even start? What do you do? I don't know. I, I look out of the window. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, I, yeah, I was, I was uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it's a good question. So the creative, the initial creative process is, um, is, is very interesting and it's, yeah, I think it's probably the best part of, of, of what we do, which is the most fun part of what we do is to come up with a project or come up with a, with a good question and a good way or a potentially good way to answer that question is, is what gets me out of bed in the morning. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, this is it. But um, the, way, yeah, the way one does it, I, I think it's, it's not, it cannot be set in stone in the sense that Typically, typically, my process is, uh, well, in some sense, it could be even embarrassing, embarrassingly uh, simple in the sense that it's just joining the dots. So luckily, what I did, what I did uh, during my career is, is basically stepping from polymer physics to a little bit of synthetic polymers to a DNA, a genome and DNA organization, a little bit of DNA topology from a mathematical perspective. And therefore, now I just need to join the dots. So what is, what is, the, what is the changes the DNA topology in vivo? So I can use a little bit of what I, what I, what I learned about molecular biology when I, when I was doing a postdoc in uh, the Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine in Edinburgh. And then from there, I can say, oh, OK, so I know that protein works that way. So for instance, topoisomerase or, an, or topoisomerase is this protein that allows DNA to process to cross through itself, say, I know that does that operation and consumes energy to do that, then uh, what kind of materials can I do or can I make using DNA and this, and this kind of protein? One of the good things about the, the group that I'm, I'm setting up and I'm, I feel particularly lucky about it is that uh, we have both exper experimentalists and theorists or, or, or people that do simulations. So we can, we can actually tackle problems in parallel. So do both experiments and simulations. Typically experiments takes much, much longer. So I think, so nowadays the way I think is that the best way is always to start with experiments and then at some point simulations um, kind of catch up. I was, I was reading a book by David Epstein recently. Uh, it's called, the, the book is called Range and he is arguing for 90% of his book is basically arguing that uh, people who have experienced many, many things in their many, many 
different aspects, different problems. They lived in different environments. They experienced different, uh, I don't know, situations. Uh, they are better They're better positioned as solving problems because they are basically they're basically uh, more able to think outside the box. And um, and I think this is uh, this is this is true, especially in uh, in in academia and especially in uh, interdisciplinary topics. So this is why I always try to encourage people to not, not to focus too much on their, so even for PhDs in particular, not to focus, I mean, you have to become the expert in your field, of course, but you have to allow some time also to explore other fields because, because it's actually quite beneficial in the long term. And you can use the, that accumulated knowledge, the, the broad knowledge, to to come up with more creative uh, solutions and or or uh, interesting questions. The scientists in the eighteen hundred, uh, they were really full run scientists, all run scientists. And this is uh, this is something that we are losing more and more. Obviously, because fields are becoming more and more specialized and narrowed, uh, and we are becoming very very I mean experts in a particular thing. But we, I think sometimes we're missing a lot of uh, that broad knowledge, uh, which I think can still, can still uh, be helpful and, uh, um, and teach us a lot. How important do you think is scientific outreach or public engagement? And do you personally do it? Yeah, that's a, it's another good question. So I, um, I think it's very important, obviously. I mean, uh, I remember, I remember when I was when I was young, when I was doing my you know high high school or whatever it's called. I, I wasn't very much exposed to what was going on in academia, and actually, I think it's it was all very mysterious to me, or even even in university. What, what was university? I mean, and uh, neither of my parents went to university, and and no one in my family, in my extended family. When I decided to go for a for a for a physics degree, for instance, my dad wasn't uh, wasn't very supportive because he, he was saying that it would it would have been too hard for me to, to do a physics degree, and uh, and uh, luckily in that case my mom was very supportive instead and said okay if he wants to do it but I I also was was a bit was quite decided I mean I you know I stood my ground and said no I want to try. Uh, but this is not with the case. I mean, if, if you find uh, another teenager who is not that sh secure about his, his or her choices, um, then it's easy to, to miss an opportunity. So I think, yeah, I think it's, um, um, it's very important. So this outreach, it will be, it's important to do and particularly perhaps not only to, to teenagers and, 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 and and children, of course, or but also to the parents, probably sometimes to the extended families as well. Uh, now, now I've done a couple of uh, physics world articles. So there is one actually that came out this week in, uh, in Physics World um, on on DNA nanotechnology. Uh, but uh, but it, it is in the plan for sure to um, to work with uh, uh, Jean Christophe Denis to to have first. Uh, some events for um, um, uh, homeschooled children. It's a subset of a population of children who are not very much targeted by, by universities because typically universities go to the schools, right? Instead, homeschooled children, uh, I think it's, um, uh, yeah, they, they, are, they are somewhat maybe overlooked. And then the other thing that would be nice to do is, is to involve more families more, more broadly. What part of your career so far have you found most fulfilling? Fulfilling. Oh, these are these are very nice questions. Yes, um, definitely. There is a, the postdoc years are are very sweet because the, you know you know enough that you are almost an independent researcher, but you also don't have all the responsibilities that you have when you're managing a group and you're teaching or. You know, doing tutoring or whatever. So in my post years, uh, I, I felt uh, I yeah I felt that was that was really nice because I, I only did uh, 
what I wanted to do from, from, from the start to the, to the end of the day. I have to say that I also was um, very lucky to end up in David Malenduzzo's group because I don't think that any boss will, uh, will allow that level of freedom. So I have to thank him a lot. That uh, basically, uh, <laughs> I remember after a couple of years that I was in uh, doing this project with him, I, I went to his office and said, okay, look, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit fed up by this. So I want to try something different and I want to try some experiments as well. And he said, yes, so this is, so, and that was a huge, I mean, not every boss, not any boss will, uh, any line manager would have said yes, simply because, you know, it takes a large part of your, of your week, of your working week to do experiments, as, as you know. But this allows me, allowed me to gain so much more knowledge about what was really going on in terms of molecular biology, in terms of hands-on, you know, getting your hands dirty on what was real and what I, what I was doing. So the counterpoint to that question, what in your career so far have you found the toughest? Mm. It's also a good question. So there are for sure a couple of uh, examples and say, but I wouldn't say that there is, I wouldn't say that there is one that dominates over the others, but I'd say that uh, during my PhD, for sure I had some, um, some, some tough times because obviously projects were not going uh, too well. So I had to kind of do a lot of things by myself um, and learn the hard way at the beginning, which is, I guess, is the way people learn the best, but it's also the slowest. So I did a lot of frustrating mistakes, a lot, a lot. So I had to redo the same simulations many, 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 many times before they actually worked. So I learned what it means to validate your results, to, you know, to be absolutely sure that everything works before, uh, you know, before commit uh, time or, or effort into, into something. And now I actually have to say that the, the current time is also, it's also a little bit tough because it's, uh, there's a lot of stress in, uh, in setting up uh, your own group, especially at the beginning when you don't have much experience as in my, in my case. So you are just starting to build your own group and lab here in Edinburgh for the very first time. And obviously this is during a global pandemic. Yeah. How are you finding that? Do you think that's affecting the ease which you can do this? Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, the, I, I'm not sure. So indeed, because it's the first time that I'm doing this, I, I don't have any other data point to compare with. The day-to-day -day basis, uh, I think is, is not, is going pretty well. And this is because um, the School of Physics has been wonderful, I think, from the point of view of managing this, uh, this problem, because it, it always allowed people who had to do experiments to go in the lab. So on a more positive, fun note, um, when you're not doing science, what do you do for fun? Do you have any hobbies? Mm, yeah, I kind of, um... <laughs> that's a good question. It would sound a bit uh, harsh, but it, I, I guess it's the way it is. Um, I had hobbies before having kids. <laughs> now, now I have. Well, so before before kids, yes. So I was I was used to play football quite uh, well, quite regularly, and um, um, and actually, so during my during my university and also high school, I, I was able to. I mean, I was paid to, to play football, so that that was uh, that that was kind of nice. And um, and, and now more recently, I did the some rock climbing. So I was climbing a little bit. Now with the kids is, is a little bit difficult. So I have a one is almost four year old and uh, the, the youngest um, daughter uh, is one, one year old. So they, yeah, they take a lot of our time. Of, uh, so if you, you've mentioned the children, how are you finding trying to balance work and life with children, especially this year when it's been so yeah. disruptive? Yeah, it's a hard. It's a yeah, it's a hard one. So luckily, my wife was uh, was in maternity leave until uh, a few months ago. We, I mean, we realized that one person, one adult against two children, that <laughs> it's not gonna work. So so yeah, so this year was a little bit tough, and um, and then and then something that I did uh, since our firstborn was to work quite a lot during the night when with my kid sleeping on top of me 
So this is, I remember writing a lot of grants with, uh, with someone <laughs> sleeping on top of me and just, you know, using kind of typing very, very weirdly with, uh, with my fingers uh, over to try to, to not wake, uh, wake him or her up. Um, and, and I'm still doing this because the youngest is still uh, waking, is still uh, going to sleep on, on top of me. <laughs> Do you have any advice for students who are just starting out or for PhD students who are reaching towards the end? Yeah. Yeah, luckily, I mean, I have, uh, I think I have, let's say my, my experience as a PhD was a very positive one. And also later in the academic uh, kind of life, if you want, until now, I've been always very, very lucky. Um, part of this, I think, was, I mean, okay, I was lucky, but I always kind of, um, perhaps a little bit uh, obsessively, but I always start very early looking for things. Like, if you want, if you want a PhD, okay, you should start, I, I started looking around for PhD more than I, one year before, before I had to, I had to to, to start and for the postdoc uh, uh, the same thing and for grants the same thing so if you start early you you get you get there that you're perhaps uh, prepared so one advice is always to start early to look around if in some sense sometimes projects do not go as well as as you hope but the trick that i kind of um learned is that if you have many projects going on at least one should go well <laughs> this is this is what i i typically always do or I, i've done during my phd so to have many open projects so that at least one is, is you know it keeps you going and uh, it gives you good results and keeps you motivated so i so i would encourage them to follow follow their their curiosity and especially so this is another thing that I suggest in general PhDs throughout their PhD, but also after the PhD, is that if their curiosity brings them to need a piece of knowledge that is not part of their group, search for it or you know, go out of your group, go out of go outside, speak with other people, push yourself outside your comfort zone in particular. So even if you're used to do, in my case, it was, you know, I do do simulations. Oh, then there is a problem that you cannot solve with simulations because whatever reason, then, then do not stop. If, if that is a good problem for you, it's an interesting problem, you, you're curious about it, don't stop simply because you cannot do simulations or you cannot do the theory. Then you simply need to learn how to do the experiments or vice versa. If the experimental problem is too difficult, it's too hard, but you're still curious about a part that you can, for instance, do a theory or a simulation, but you, you do not know how to do it, learn learn how to do it learn how to do simulation and, and theory i was I, I was i remember during my phd i was speaking with a, with a very smart guy and this guy said once to me that uh, there is no such thing as a as an a theoretical or experimental uh, scientist it's just a scientist mm -hmm.